Welcome to The Weaver Sews. I'm Daryl Lancaster. And I'm Brianna Lancaster. Brianna, who is my daughter, is usually behind the camera and the computer. At the beginning of March 2021, we hit 1,000 subscribers. I thought, with my millennial knowledge of YouTube, that we should do an AMA or Ask Me Anything to celebrate. These are the questions y'all sent us. Leslie from Tasmania wrote, Just discovered you and love your teaching method. I started weaving late last year and have just made a lined vest from the fabric. I would like to top stitch by machine around the armholes and all around the neck and front opening. I cannot remember when I started sewing from mum's scraps, 72 years in a few weeks, but never handwoven fabric. Would love your advice. How completely wonderful is a medium where you can connect with someone halfway around the world? So Leslie from Tasmania. The subject of top stitching is one that I had planned for a whole video. In fact, I'm not a fan of top stitching hand wovens, mostly because the top stitching gets lost. If I do top stitch, I use a doubled thread on top, which could be either two stacked bobbins or two spools. Most machines have two spool pins and I use a longer stitch. I'm more of a fan of couching, like you see here on this jacket. Couching is a surface application technique where the decorative stitching line is really a heavier yarn, maybe one you wove with, with a very narrow zigzag holding it down. There's a special foot for this. Most machines have something like this available and the name of the foot differs with the sewing machine brand. Most commonly, you'll see it called a cording foot. The yarn is inserted under the cording foot, dropped into the tunnel, and away you go. I do plan to do a more extensive video on top stitching and couching. So stay tuned for that. Wonderful. Another viewer asked, how do you store your handwoven cloth? In the background of your fabulous videos, there is fabric rolled around a tube, fabric folded then rolled loosely, and possibly fabric wrapped around flat cardboard as is typically done in fabric stores. Curious viewers make me smile. Here's a quick survey of my background shelving and what's on them. The large rolls in the corner are industrial rolls of interfacing. The two types that I sell, Fusey Knit, and a type I call Texturized Weft Insertion. I've frequently used both in previous videos. They come on huge rolls, 200 yards by 60 inches wide, and for my metric friends, that's 182 meters by 1.5 meters. Those just sit in the corner in a plastic container in case of flooding because, you know, I've no place else to put them. On top, to keep them up and away from the cat, I have a couple rolls of handwoven fabric. I have a stash of cardboard tubes, and for the narrower fabrics, a gift wrap tube can work or a length of PVC pipe. The boarded fabrics stacked behind are actually bolts of linings, um, some vintage, and interfacings that I might use for a specific task. Below the boarded linings and interfacings are rolled commercial fabrics tied with bias strips. I can see what I have and remove a fabric without disturbing the rest. Fantastic. Ties into the next question. Diane Mitra writes, I plan on weaving about 10 to, or 20 meters of cloth to sew into clothes for myself and my husband. I also would like to know how to store the cloth until I can sew it. I store my handwoven fabrics on rolls, like we just saw, out of the light, easy in this basement studio, and I always tuck in a bar of Irish Spring Soap. Um, this, this, I have no idea if this is available around the world, but here in the U.S., this has been around for many, many years. I heard 
probably some 40 years ago that this soap repelled moths and other pesky insects. I can't say if it scientifically works. Just anecdotal experience. I buy the stuff by the case from Amazon and yes, it smells really strong. Yeah, um, but the strong smell fades, apparently not though, to moths. I've never had a moth problem in all the years that I've been doing this. I tuck bars of soap in fleeces, in the back of yarn shelves, behind the fabrics, especially the wool ones. I refuse to use toxic repellents and keep crossing my fingers that my little bars of soap will continue to do the job. Fantastic. Grace asks, how, where to find a good body double for fitting? What to look for, what to avoid. I'm a bit tentative to cut into my hand woven in special fabrics, aren't we all, mm -hmm. without a way to really make them fit well. Well, while we're touring this set, I have a couple of mannequins, which are really my dress forms. Do I take that off? I've used this brand of dress form since around the mid-1960s. The brand is called Uniquely You, and yes, they're still around. They consist of a muslin cover um, over a very curvy foam dummy on a stand. I replace the foam dummy about every 25 years. Uh, foam does eventually disintegrate but they are reasonably priced for a dress form. They don't work for everyone um, because so much depends on your body type, but I love the flexibility to get the fit more custom and the ability to pin into it when designing. The muslin cover unzips and there are tons of seams that are adjusted with the help of a friend and that makes the muslin cover contour to your exact shape. Then it's zipped back onto the form uh, and a bit of alligator wrestling is required and the form is pretty close to your measurements with ease, though you can remove the ease if you want. There is a link in the show notes for a supplier of this form. There are lots of other dress forms out there. An afternoon of reading reviews and comparisons of many of these forms is really informative. Pick something you can afford with as much flexibility as you can get, especially for altering if you change size. And pick something you can pin into. Now we have a nice segue into the next question. Claudia asks, muslins with five exclamation points. And when you finally sew one that works for you, do you just rip it apart and use it as your final pattern? First, what's a muslin? A muslin, that's spelled M-U-S-L-I-N, or sometimes called toile, T-O-I-L-E, which is French, um, is an initial mock-up of a garment made in cheap fabric so you can check the fit, the position of elements, and whether you even like the whole look. Every garment I make is tested first, sometimes more than once. I might use actual muslin fabric, which can be expensive, or I might use an old beach towel for a lofty hand woven, I might even use a cheap woven plaid to see if the grain lines are correct. Um, and it's not uncommon for me to use old bed sheets. Any changes that I make in custom fitting that test garment then get translated back to the flat pattern. Taking the test garment apart and trying to use it as a pattern can be challenging because it's really tough to get the grain lines completely perpendicular and parallel to each other. I do plan to do a lot of videos on fit. My daughter has a very different body that type than I do. 
and I'm looking forward to showing how to adjust my patterns to different fit issues. So, next question. Jules asks, I love your videos. I am eagerly awaiting the possibility to learn how to piece scraps of hand wovens with bias tubes. Okay, this is another one of those questions that I'm planning an entire video on, eventually. What Jules is referring to is my technique for piecing together scraps of hand woven fabric and covering the butt joints with bias strips. Unfortunately, this is a topic that I'm currently teaching remotely and have a couple of workshops booked into the summer where students are actually paying to study this technique. So it would be tough to put it out there on YouTube for free. I will do, I promise, an extensive video on this eventually. And I do cover this and many more techniques on what to do with leftover scraps in my Leftovers monograph, which is available as a digital download in my e-store. The link is below. Mickey asks, how do you address areas in the hand-woven garment where curves need to be clipped, mm. such as a neckline mm -hmm. or a princess seam? Mm -hmm. Would you recommend fray check or zigzag stitches across the clipped sections? Hmm. The answer to this is complicated. Largely, it depends on whether the seam allowances will be visible once the garment is completed. For areas like necklines, there is the assumption that a facing or collar or trim will cover those seam allowances, so clipping to allow the fabric to lay smoothly is not a problem. And in reality, many hand wovens are extremely flexible in areas cut off grain. We have talked about grain lines extensively in previous videos. So they often flex without having to clip. If I had something really ravelly that would be encased later on, like a neckline, I'd probably first fuse a crosswise cut strip of fusy knit, which has flex to it, along the edge of the garment and then clip once I did the stay stitching. Even straight stitching with the grain first before you clip will stop any unraveling. We talked about all of that in a video on what to do with cut edges. So areas like princess seams, I should probably explain what a princess seam is. You wanna sure. go ahead and? A uh, princess seam is typically an extension of a waist dart up through the bust line and into the shoulder. Some go into the armhole, but that's the typical over the bust line seam. And typically a princess seam is replacing a dart, which gives it that extra curve. Which hence the question and why it's appropriate. Areas like princess seams are more problematic because the seam allowance is visible inside the garment. For dresses and tops, I might finish the edge after it's clipped and then spread. I should go grab them, shouldn't I? Yeah, that'll at least keep them out of that. Yeah, okay. Yep. Okay. This is what we gotta deal with. For dresses and tops, I might finish the edge after it's clipped and spread with the nylon trico seam finish I discussed in a previous video. The trico can be applied with the clipped curve spread open. Now for princess seams in an unlined jacket, I wouldn't clip. Instead, I would apply a welt seam finish, which is sort of like a one-sided Hong Kong seam finish with the seam allowances pressed to the side so no clipping is necessary. I don't want to say, never use fray check, but I'm not a fan of putting a permanent glue onto the edges of my hand-woven fabrics. 
though I am a fan of fusing underlinings and interfacing, so there's that. I do plan to do a video on flat felled and welt seams, so stay tuned. Another note on interesting seams, Wendy asks, I'd like your thoughts on an elbow dart for jackets. I've always appreciated them in a pattern and thought they would be especially helpful in hand wovens. Mm -hmm. If you think they would be, would this be an easy enough pattern alteration? Hmm. Elbow darts in sleeves do give a great fit to a sleeve. Perfect for a hand woven. My patterns don't feature elbow darts, but many commercial patterns do. And until I develop a video on how to alter a sleeve to add an elbow dart or develop a pattern with one, just use a commercial pattern for the shape. Wendy also writes, hopefully my 26 inch max weaving width won't give me too much loom envy. <laughs> Wendy, many of my looms are only 25 inches wide and that will net you a nice piece of yardage. Remember, garments have seams. This dress was from four nine inch wide scarves with some creative piecing at the hip. For my metric friends, that's less than 23 centimeters. So here are more pieces that were all woven on a 25 inch loom. Another viewer asks, do you ever place pattern pieces for fronts, backs, or sleeves on the crosswise grain? This would mean the weft hanging vertically on the body. Yes, I do this frequently. I use whatever grain direction will give me the look I want. This jacket body was cut on the crosswise grain, yokes and sleeves on the lengthwise grain. You do whatever it takes. Another viewer asks, your videos are an amazing inspiration and definitely a great help. I would love to know where you get your inspiration for the amazing fabric and clothing designs. I know the topic of this channel is sewing, but did you make any videos about painting your warp before? Your hand painted and hand woven fabrics are so beautiful and unique. One day, I'll add videos that offer tips and tricks for weaving yardage. But there are many weaving teachers out there who are struggling to create online content that they hope to be paid for. And I don't want to take anything away from their chance to earn a living. Yes, I do paint a lot of warps and dye my own yarn. But there are warp dyers and painters out there like Catherine Weber of Blazing Shuttles who do teach. And that wouldn't really be fair. And all the dye suppliers like Pro Chemical and Dharma Trading, they have information on their websites about painting yarns and warps and other how-to tutorials. If I could though, give one piece of advice that would be to plan a repeat about every 30 inches or 76 centimeters or so roughly the length of a jacket. It will be critical for matching areas and make sure that the hand painted repeat runs in the same direction as opposed to, you know, mirroring itself. So all your pattern pieces can then run in the same direction. As for inspiration, I should say, and I've probably mentioned this in a previous video, though I don't remember which one, that I weave because I like to weave. All the fabrics here were woven because I wanted to explore a yarn or a structure or a combination of something. I was inspired by a long walk in the woods 
something I saw in a book or a magazine, a lecture or a workshop from another creative person, or just yarn on my shelf. Sometimes I just start with a basket of odd things and then eventually see what I can do with it. I have no plan as to what I want to do with my fabric once it's woven. I don't plan any of my garments and I don't even plan when I dye warps or yarns. She does not. I just weave. And don't be afraid of color. If you think it's ugly, it probably won't be. Right. <laughs> so Diametra from Australia, as we heard from before, had a multiple part question and we decided to break it up. So the rest of her questions were, where to begin? Should I use plain weave to start with? What techniques are best for what kind of fabrics and clothes? What are the best lightweight yarns to use for summer tops since I live in Australia? Mm. I would not enjoy living in Australia. <laughs> no, you would not. <laughs> I sweat too easily. And on the same topic, another viewer from the Southern US asked, it would be great to hear your thoughts on yarn selection for weaving or garments. Do you ever mix protein and cellulose fibers in the same project? What are your recommendations for weaving for lightweight summery tops? Wow. I give whole lectures on this subject. And again, that will be an entire video or two eventually. There goes my weekend. <laughs> but I'll try to summarize. I've been teaching for a lot of years. And I have seen an enormous body of handwoven fabrics come through my classes. I can't think of a single structure or fiber or combination of fibers that wouldn't work because I make everything work. It's what I do. I even had a student bring a real honest to goodness tapestry to class once and wanted it for the back of her jacket. And we made it work for climate. You can't beat the cellulose fibers. They would be cotton, regenerated cellulose, which are the rayons and tencel and rayon from bamboo. And of course the bast fibers like linen or hemp or ramy. This top was created from combining almost all the fibers I just listed. If you want a lighter fabric, use finer yarns. And set is important here. Um, that's how many warp ends you have in an inch or two and a half centimeters. Always choose a set that is denser than you think, especially a 210 cell. I typically set that at 36 ends per inch. Those weaver people, you know what that means. <laughs> Structures like huck or any of the lace weaves um, make beautiful summer tops. I actually had a student weave a lovely linen fabric and make my 700 tunic. Yes, it wrinkles, it's linen. I mix fibers all the time. Both of these jackets, actually I'm wearing one of them, have hand dyed stripes of cellulose yarns next to loop mohair yarns in the warp. More commonly, I put all the cellulose yarns in the warps and then weave with a protein fiber in the weft so I can full it up and make a really stable fabric. This coat uh, used Jaeger Spun's Zephyr, which is a merino and silk combination, as the weft. I talked about some of this in the Washing Your Fabric video. So, Pick a structure you like. Two shuttle weaves do slow you down, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't try them. Fabrics with strong weft patterning are hard to match up at the side seams, but you, know, you can always turn the fabric and cut it crosswise like I did on this coat. The warp goes around the body. Don't be afraid to experiment. Cloth is cloth and there is always a way to make it work. There's a lifetime of exploration awaiting all of us, and you never know till you try. Often what I put on a loom is something just to see if it will work. 
Or I hear someone say in a lecture that something won't work. Them's fighting words. Mm -hmm. I want to see for myself. There is always a way. I'm Daryl Lancaster. And I'm Brianna Lancaster. For the Weaver Sews. <laughs>